Good morning, my friends. We want to welcome you to our Sunday morning worship service here at Valder Rose United Methodist Church. It is the third, third Sunday of Lent as we continue to make our journey toward Passion Week and ultimately uh, for Easter Sunday. We are so glad that you're with us. Wherever you have joined us from, we are glad that you're here. We're going to be taking communion today, so if you want to put together your elements, which can be milk and cookies, coffee and a donut, coffee and a cookie, uh, some wine and some bread, grape juice and bread, or crackers, whatever you find, it will all work fine for our communion experience together. We will do the sacrament together and the Lord will bless us because our heart and soul is in the right place on this Sunday. My friends, we also want to remind you that we're continuing in our stewardship drive, and by now most of you will have received the packet and the information within it, explaining a little bit about what we're doing and why we're doing it, and we hope that you will take that card that was sent to you and complete it and send it in to the church with your pledge, with your gift for this coming year. It's important that we receive that. We appreciate you participating. Thank you very, very much. We also are moving toward reopening. And I have a statement that I would like to read to you. And I read it because I want you all to get exactly the same information and hear precisely what we're thinking about as we move toward March 28. So please listen carefully to this. I am happy to announce that with the concurrence of your congregational leadership, staff, and pastors, we plan to resume in-person worship beginning on Palm Sunday, March 28, 2021, with a 9.30 a.m. traditional service. We will have services as usual for all of Holy Week, including Maundy Thursday, Good Friday, as well as on Easter. For the time in the near future, Sunday service will only be traditional at 9.30 a.m. It is important that we inform you, the members of Elder Rose United Methodist Church, of the plans and processes that we have put in place for your safety. All parts of the plan are developed to create a worship experience that is clean, safe, and mindful of health needs and issues with a non-touch experience. The purpose of this announcement is to convey information from the reopening committee to let you know three things. First, we are being aggressive in responding to the COVID-19 pandemic, and that when we return, every safeguard will have been taken to protect our community of faith from contracting the virus. Secondly, our style of worship will not be as you normally experience. We will continue to practice social distancing, wearing masks, and disinfecting our worship spaces as required by the guidelines of the United Methodist Church, the CDC, and state and local entities. It is your choice to return to in-gathering worship. We will continue to record and live stream our services as we return to worship in church. Our return to a semblance of normality will be a process. Therefore, this is what we'll be requiring when you do return, and this is part of the third statement. Completing a temperature check and health screening, maintaining a social distance of six feet from those not in your immediate family, the wearing of masks during worship. If you are unable to wear one, we recommend you continue to worship remotely. No hugging, no handshaking, or touching. We will sing and have responsive and group liturgy. Masks need to remain in place. Since we may have to limit seating, we are asking that you notify us of your intent to worship in person. A process will be detailed shortly as we also develop plans to handle overflow if the need arises. 
And finally, there will be other guidance prior to our restart. So watch our online services, social media channels, and website to stay abreast of what is emerging. We look forward to returning. We look forward to seeing all of you face to face. And now let us pause as we prepare our hearts to continue to worship with our prelude. Christ, we do all adore thee. I invite you to join with Pastor Daniel and myself in our call to worship. The law of the Lord is perfect. Reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. They are more desirable than gold and sweeter than honey. Please join us in an attitude of prayer. All wise and all loving God, we are drawn together in this place because all our knowledge and discernment is not enough to give meaning to our lives. All the pieces of our busy days need a center, and we have come to see that center in the foolishness of the cross. There, love went the distance for us. There, the paths of service were lifted up above our passion for personal gain. We are frightened by what you might ask of us. But we long for the wholeness only you can offer. To bear fruit is both a gift and a responsibility. Join us 
with our hymn of praise. Go tell it on the mountain. The reading from the Hebrew Bible is 2 Kings 4, 8 through 17. One day Elisha went down to the town of Shunem. A wealthy woman lived there, and she urged him to come to her home for a meal. After that, whenever he passed that way, he would stop there for something to eat. She said to her husband, I am sure this man who stops in from time to time is a holy man of God. Let's build a small room for him on the roof and furnish it with a bed, a table, a chair, and a lamp. Then he will have a place to stay whenever he comes by. One day Elisha returned to Shunem, and he went up to this upper room to rest. He said to his servant, Gehazi, tell the woman from Shunem, I want to speak to her. When she appeared, Elisha said to Gehazi, tell her, we appreciate the kind concern you have shown us. What can we do for you? Can we put in a good word for you to the king or to the commander of the army? No, she replied, my family takes good care of me. Later, Elisha asked Gehazi, what can we do for her? Gehazi replied, she doesn't have a son, and her husband is an old man. Call her back again, Elisha told him. When the woman returned, Elisha said to her as she stood in the doorway, next year, at this time, you will be holding a son in your arms. No, my lord, she cried. O man of God, don't deceive me and get my hopes up like that. But sure enough, the woman soon became pregnant. And at that time, the following year, 
she had a son, just as Elisha had said. My friends, let us pause now and prepare our hearts for communion. Let us sing 618 in the hymnal, Let Us Break Bread Together. We hope you are able to join us with a piece of bread and something to drink as we begin our invitation this morning to our Holy Communion. 
He was always the guest in the homes of Peter and Jairus, Martha and Mary, Joanna and Susanna. He was always the guest at the meal tables of the wealthy where he pled the case of the poor. He was always the guest upsetting polite company, befriending isolated people, welcoming the stranger. He was always the guest. But here at this table, he is the host. So friends, come to the Lord's table, all you who love him. Come to the Lord's table. Confess your sin. Come to the Lord's table and be at peace. For this is the table where God intends us to be nourished. This is the time when Christ can make us new. So come, you who hunger and thirst for a deeper faith, for courage to save others, for a better world. Jesus Christ, who has sat at our tables, now invites us to be guests at his. So let us confess our sins before God and one another. Please join with me in our prayer of confession. Holy God, you have called us to live in faith and freedom, but we live with tightness in our chest. You have called us to move in a new direction, but we cling to the path we know. You have called us to reach outward in love, but we draw inward for protection. You have called us to live with abandon in trust, but we live carefully in fear. Forgive us, we pray. Hear these wonderful words of assurance. God sent Jesus not to judge us, but to save us. God accepts both our courage and our fears. In the name of Christ, your sins are forgiven. And in the name of Christ, your sins are forgiven. In this bread and in this cup, we celebrate something we can't quite understand. Because God has made a house at this table. Because God had also made a table at your house. Because God satisfies our hunger in the most unlikely places. Because God comes to be with us now and always. It is with this expectation that we come to the table to taste and see that God is here. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, into this bread and into this cup, come. Come into this bread and this cup and transform these ordinary objects as you change our hearts to shape and form your world with the joy you promise. Pour your grace upon us so we overflow with your love. Help us to remember how a newborn baby might grow into a little child that would one day turn to his hope-filled friends in an upper room. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. 
Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And let us listen now to a beautiful song, Were You There? The reading from the epistle is 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 27. The human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. 
Some of us are Jews, some of us are Gentiles, some are slaves, and some are free. But we have all been baptized into one body by one spirit, and we all share the same spirit. Yes, the body has many different parts, not just one part. If the foot says, I am not a part of the body because I am not a hand, that does not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear says, I am not part of the body because I am not an eye, would that make it any less a part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, how would you hear? Or if your whole body were an ear, how would you smell anything? But our bodies have many parts, and God has put each part just where he wants it. How strange a body would be if it had only one part. Yes, there are many parts, but only one body. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The head can't ever say to the feet, I don't need you. In fact, some parts of the body that seem weakest and least important are actually the most necessary. And the parts we regard as less honorable are those we clothe with the greatest care. So we carefully protect those parts that should not be seen, while the more honorable parts do not require this special care. So God has put the body together such that extra honor and care are given to those parts that have less dignity. This makes for harmony among the members so that all the members care for each other. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. And if one part is honor, honored, all the parts are glad. All of you together are Christ's body, and each of you is a part of it. Let us join together in prayer this Sunday morning. If you have someone in mind <clears throat> that you feel that you want to also pray for, mention their name or names. And together, you and I will accomplish much in praying on behalf of them. Holy God, you have called us to live before you and with one another in all faithfulness. We pray for healing and reconciliation where trust has been broken, hostility has flared, and misunderstandings have grown. Restore us not only to one another, but reconcile us to ourselves and to you, loving God. We pray for those who are ill in mind, body, or spirit. For those lonely and isolated from community. For those burdened by guilt or grief. By depression or despair. Do not let us turn inward as a church. Lest we shut out or neglect those who long for a community of welcome and companionship. Send us out in love with open eyes, ears, and hearts. Make us true neighbors to one another and true children of your own calling. We pray in the name of Christ who has come to set us free. Amen. Let us in gratitude and thanksgiving join together in saying the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Church, we want to continue to celebrate and continue 
to let you know what a blessed and giving congregation Valderose Church is. We want to continue to encourage you to trust and to remain faithful with what God has put upon your heart with regards to your giving unto your church. Let us offer a word of prayer for our offering this morning. O Lord, our God, we want to follow all your commandments to only love you, not worshiping the things of the world, to love our neighbor freely, and not desiring for ourselves something that they possess. Accept these offerings, we pray, and teach us to be generous, giving fully of ourselves that we may truly be the body of Christ in the world. Amen. And this morning, for our offer, offertory special, we have in this very room. I pray that you would enjoy.
the reading from the Gospel is John chapter 15, verses 1 through 5 and 12 through 15. I am the true grapevine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so that they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends since I have told you everything the Father told me. This ends the lesson. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now we'd like to you to enjoy the hymn of preparation, which is hymn number 68, when in our music, God is glorified.
As Pastor Larry announced last Sunday and earlier this morning, that we are planning to open for in-person worship on Sunday, March the 28th, which is uh, the celebration of Palm Sunday. Uh, All of us here at the church, the staff uh, with the musicians, we have really experienced doing church, if you will, preparing the worship service. We have experienced it in so many different ways. And I would add that all of us are, are, are a bit, not physically tired, but it takes a lot. It takes a lot more to prepare a worship service that is going to be recorded so that you and others can view it uh, in the comfort of your home or your office or as you're driving in, uh, or parked at a parking lot or what have you, that you could listen to it or view it. It really takes a lot, and there has been many individuals that have helped, that have participated with their ideas, with their creativity, so that we would be able to um, pre- give a presentation of a recorded online worship service that is, number one, uh, essential in this worship, but that it's also done right, that it's done right so that you and, and others can Uh, be ministered to, not just by the preaching and teaching of the word, but by the whole program, uh, the combination of the music, the the worship component. We want you to experience the presence of Christ there, wherever you may be. And it's been a while since we have had the opportunity to meet together in person. Me personally, you already know, every pastor, every preacher, teacher, everyone has their own personality. Everyone has their own way of preaching and teaching. Uh, I, I, I am anxious to come from behind the pulpit so that I can just be free and stand in front. And if I want to walk to the left, if I want to walk to the right, that's me. That's, that's how I flow in the sermon. That's how I am comfortable. That's my zone. It makes those people in the sound booth with the sound system and with the cameras a little nervous if I begin to do that right now since we are recording. But just thought I'd share a little bit of uh, my anxious moments that I'm having to come to uh, in-person worship. I hope to see every one of you here on that Sunday. The story that we read in uh, 2 Kings chapter 4 is usually often titled as the, uh, the prophet Elisha and the Shunammite woman. The Shunammite woman is from, was from a town called Shunem. was a small town just off, a, uh, off of a major international roadway known as the Via Maris. The Via Maris back then was a major trade route in the ancient Near East going from Egypt through Israel and up to Damascus, where it then connected with other routes to Assyria or Babylon. This was a major pipeline for trade, and the people who lived along the route had a chance to profit by the travelers and live in a wider world due to the trade potential. This town, Shunem, was in a region that we know the prophets were active but it's away from Elisha's home, which was in Samaria. It makes a lot of sense that he needed somewhere to stop and rest, somewhere to land when he was in this region. This saga in 2 Kings chapter 4 really revolves around this woman who notices the traveling Elisha and shows him hospitality by giving him some food. She constrained him to eat bread She had observed him at all times pass that way, and she guessed that perhaps this was an individual that was a a religious man, and therefore took an opportunity to invite uh, Elisha and Gehazi, his servant, into her house for some lunch. And so it was that as often as he passed by, he visited her her home to eat bread, being made very welcome, and encouraged by the free and kind entertainment that he received. Shunem, the town, was not very far from Carmel, which the prophet Elisha frequented, and lay in the way to Samaria, Bethel, and Jericho, places 
that he often visited because the schools of the prophets were located in these places. Some Bible preachers or teachers have a tendency of interpreting and preaching 2 Kings chapter 4 this way. They tend to, whether, especially if it's a male preacher, they have a tendency of reading and interpreting 2 Kings chapter 4. Uh, to me, it's unfair the way that it's being done because what they do is as they begin to expound in their message with the scripture that was read, this woman becomes a subject uh, of finger pointing. They make this woman, the Shunammite woman, to be a woman that lost her way, to be a woman that lost her faith somewhere, somehow. And they'll even offer titles uh, indicating that uh, do not lose it in the way or uh, you gave up too soon. Uh, things like that about this Shunammite woman. I, I've never really read that in the context of this portion of scripture. On the contrary, I think this woman needs to be highly admired and respected. I think this is a woman that was ahead of her times and I think this was a woman of faith, period. Unshakable, unwavering faith. I am intrigued how she saw that this traveling prophet and his servant, Gehazi, when she realized that they were perhaps religious folks, after she engaged them and invited them to come into the house for lunch, after doing this a few other weeks, perhaps a few months, she eventually realized the best way I can help them is if we build a room upstairs and put a bed in there and a little desk and a, and a little lamp and, and a chair so that they can have somewhere to lay their head. But I'd like to take it a little bit further. Many scriptures, many times other different Bible translations do not call it like the scripture that we read, the New Living Translation, it says that she talked to her husband and she decided, why don't we uh, build a room upstairs so that they can have a place to lay their head? Other Bible translations call it, why don't we build them an upper room? And eventually, this woman, I think, that's what she was referring to. This man of God and Gehazi, his servant, they need to come and have lunch, have dinner, have a place to rest. And they also are looking, seeking for a place where they can have an upper room experience. I think that the reason why she said this was because she already knew from her own personal intimate relationship with God what an upper room experience was like. So she understood that concept. And yes, she probably went before God, she and her husband, at one time or another, they probably asked, why can't we have any children? She probably decided that it was time to bring it before her God. And they did. And she did. And then she probably came back the next day or the next week. And maybe she did it again the next month. And maybe she did it again the month after that. I believe that being a woman of faith, she knew who she needed to go to. But at the same time, she knew that there was a time that she needed to stop no more god already knows it done it's like sometimes in the church in our local congregation you have an individual for instance a woman that just had a miscarriage and some of the loving caring members of the congregation go to be with her go to be with her and her husband her and the family so that they can offer some sort of uh encouragement with their presence and so on so they get to know that she wants a child but she had a miscarriage so now they begin to pray on her behalf they begin to invite her to come after the worship service so that the pastor can pray for her and perhaps they do this sunday after sunday after sunday until eventually perhaps this woman in the local congregation that had a miscarriage will say it's done God knows me by name. God knows who I am. God knows the desire of my heart. I no longer need to go before the throne of God, knocking 
with what he already knows that I need. I call that being a woman of faith. I don't see her giving up in any way. And the reason I'm making this analogy is because we experienced that, Delia and I. We had a miscarriage, we had the second one, and we had the third one. And we kind of wondered if maybe it wasn't meant for us. But eventually Delia's faith rose up, she stood up and she says, I've already spoken with God, it's done, it's done. I will have three sons and I will have them three years apart. We don't need to pray about this anymore because God already knows. But the kind-hearted, loving people from our church back in San Diego would still come after every Sunday's worship service so that they can come and pray for us, so that the pastor can come and pray. Okay. Then next Sunday, they would do the same. Then next Sunday, they would want to do the same. Oh, lo and behold, we're having a guest preacher, a guest evangelist. Let's make sure that he prays over Delia and Daniel. No. It's done. God already knows. So I believe that this Shunammite woman was in the same position, in the same place in her faith. She appreciated the effort that the prophet wanted to do something for her in return of her attentive uh, preparations of the meal and the lodging. He wanted to do something for her. And she says, I'm fine. I'm taking care of my family. When he found out, the prophet, that she was without a child, it wasn't that the woman was without faith. She wasn't offended. She just realized, it's done, sir. It's already taken care of. My God and I have had some times together in that upper room. I know what the upper room experience is like. That's why, thank you. And then we go back to see how she continued to care and to take care of the prophet, Gehazi, and even other people in her community. Why is that? Because when you have a personal intimate relationship with God, the fruitfulness of that is that you want to become outward in witnessing your faith, but in also being the instrument, being the vessel that God will use to be able to fill the needs, to supply the needs, the voids in uh, other people's lives. When we go to John chapter 15, we begin to see something similar taking place here. The disciples had just shared in the Passover supper with Jesus. He humbly washed their feet and began to describe the events that would lead to his crucifixion. It is uncertain how much the disciples understood about what was about to take place. But Jesus proceeds to comfort them and prepare them for his coming death. Through the Last Supper, the washing of the feet, and Jesus' words in John 14 about the way to the Father and the promised Holy Spirit, Jesus emphasizes the themes of unity, obedience, and love. This section of scripture, along with chapters 15, 16, and 17, continue in these same themes, and they have become known as Jesus' farewell discourse. Jesus knew that he was about to leave the disciples, and he takes this time to prepare them for their mission in the period of his absence between his resurrection and return. It is clear from John's gospel in the chapters of this discourse that Jesus prioritized both preparing and encouraging his followers. He wanted to inform, inform them of how to remain in connection with him, encourage, encouraging them not to fall away and telling them to continue in the love that he had shown them. John chapter 15 uses an analogy of a vine and its branches, to summarize these important lessons. In this passage, Jesus prepares his disciples for his time away from earth by challenging them to remain in him through obedience and love. By abiding in this way, Christians will bear the fruit of righteousness and salvation and maintain the relationships that bring glory to God. 
It is not surprising that Jesus would use an agricultural analogy since the culture of the Bible was primarily agrarian. Agrarian comparisons were also used often in Christ's teachings, which are recorded in the gospel accounts, such as the parable of the sower, the parable of the weeds, the parable of the mustard seed, the parable of the workers in the vineyard. Because agrarian practices were known and familiar, Jesus used them so that his audience would be more likely to understand his teachings. Jesus describes here the essence of a fruitful Christian life by faith. We must stay connected to Christ every second of every day to live the most God-honoring and abundant life of peace and fruitfulness in Christ. After explaining to his disciples how his father is the gardener that prunes each branch so that it can bear more fruit, Jesus urges them to stay grafted, stay connected. The image is powerful. But how does one stay connected this way? God is the vine grower, Jesus as the vine, and we as the branches. Jesus' role as the vine is twice identified in verse 1 as the true vine, and in verse 5 as the vine. This is the life source of the branches. It is God who tends to the flourishing of the branches and likewise will remove every branch that gives no yield. What is the key for this work of the vineyard? It is abiding. What is the meaning of abiding in Jesus, the risen one during this post-resurrection season? First, the relationship of abiding means that we cannot go it alone in our spiritual lives. What Parker Palmer once described as a free-floating spirituality, Jesus notes the impossibility, Jesus notes the impossible cannot happen. The branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless you abide in me, says John 15, verse 4. It is no secret that, that somebody, you can be deeply engaged in things of the church in publicly meaningful ways, and yet the activities may not be truly connected to Christ. In that case, the vine grower eventually gets around to pruning such branches. The possibilities of going it alone in American society are widespread and, well, yes, inviting. Carried over into the spiritual life, this fact can have devastating results. Second, Beyond the fact of reliance, abiding in Christ, divine means change. John 15, 5 notes that abiding means the opportunity to bear much fruit. As with any lively metaphor, it invites the listeners to expand on its possibilities in their own lives. We are free to make much of metaphors, and this one is no exception. It means plenty, abundance, life-giving and pleasing. But what might that be? Would bearing, would bearing fruit mean what? A renewal of hope for a dying congregation? Would bearing fruit mean a recommitment and new unity of purpose in a congregation ripped by conflict? Would bearing fruit mean a congregation beginning to see and respond to the poor, the hungry, and the imprison in their community in a way they had not seen before? Abiding in Christ establishes a communication element that does not exist outside of the divine human relationship. Jesus invites those who are intent on abiding in him to ask for whatever you wish and it will be done for you. John chapter 15, verse 7. What an amazing directive. When you stay connected, when you abide in him, you get to apply verse 7 in John chapter 15 and ask for whatsoever you will. 
The fruit that Jesus means for his disciples to bear is that of the Holy Spirit, which is found in Galatians chapter 6. The fruit of the Holy Spirit, not fruits, not plural, the fruit, one, which is the fruit of the Holy Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And also that of effective ministry unto others. Usually those that are outside of your comfort zone, which would be the congregation, to be fruitful and to be in effective ministry unto others. As we launch this stewardship campaign this year, what a challenge it was for us to put together our, 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 our planning and organizing heads so that we could perhaps bring in some creativity given the nature of our world and of our country um, going through a pandemic. How are we able to speak to the congregation about stewardship? And after prayerful discernment and many conversations, we were able to put together a five-week, six-week plan. I don't know if you were able to tune in to our program last Sunday. Our senior pastor, Larry Norris, preached a sermon that still I am squeezing things out of it. My wife, Delia, and I have listened to many, many, many sermons on giving, on stewardship. But I must say that Pastor Larry's sermon last Sunday is one that, it, that it's still continuing to teach us about stewardship and what it means. I have been given the great responsibility to manage that which God has given me, that with, with which God has blessed me with, so that I can be provided, attended to, taken care of for me and my family, my household. But I also am giving enough, plenty, to be able to provide for those, to be able to give, to be able to attend to the needs of those on the left and those on the right. And Velda Rose Church, this is who you are. You are a giving congregation. You are a church that gives because you know that you have been giving. And you give of your tithe, of your offering, of your special gifts. When I first started here two years ago, I was very surprised that this church had a food pantry, that it had the likes of the UMW Mission Building and all the activities that take place throughout the year in order to prepare for the twice-a-year weekend sales to be able to raise those funds, to be able to gather those monies so that ministries, social service agencies, ministries that work with single women, with children, ministries that work with uh, children, with youth, with families, you have been able to provide for so many resources for a lot of these um, uh, ministries and social service agencies. At Velda Rose Church, we also have the Samaritan Fund. Some of you are able to provide, you know, $15, $20, $40 as, a, as an offering <clears throat> towards <clears throat> the Samaritan Fund. That Samaritan Fund has been able to provide assistance by the way of um, having a conversation with the family that is in need of before they become evicted uh, and homeless from their apartment, from their home, or the area elementary schools that will call us and ask us if we would be able to adopt a family because uh, the husband was, is unemployed, the wife is not working, and the children need clothing. We provide food, we provide clothing. At times we go and meet them at the pharmacy to buy their prescriptions or even to, as we learned something very new in March and April and May, that a lot of the families of the elementary and junior high um, schools, some of them didn't have internet so that they can adequately do their uh, online schooling during the day. But we do so much because of your stewardship that you have made a commitment at the beginning of the year that you are going to provide towards the congregation because of its ministries. Let me tell you a quick story. We, Velderos Church, have been able to provide presence with many different... <clears throat> we have built a network 
within the city of Mesa, with other churches, with Mesa PD, and uh, with the uh, mayor's office, <clears throat> and United Way, and other social service offices. We implemented something that we used to do in Las Vegas years ago. There are five churches that, are, that participate in this program, and one church is assigned every weekend. So if Mesa PD goes out on a call after 4 o'clock p.m. on a Friday, uh, all the way through uh, early morning Monday, and they need to remove the family, they need to remove the victim and any children, a lot of the shelters are already closed for the weekend. So where, where, where can you take these victims of domestic violence or family abuse? Well, we get called once or twice a month. Uh, we meet Mesa PD and the victim and the children at an undisclosed location. And then we have Velderos Church through the Samaritan Fund has already created um, a network of hotels uh, that have kitchenettes and are able to provide space up to six for sleeping. A um, little while ago, a few weeks ago, got a call um, about 11 o'clock at night um, to meet Mesa PD because of a victim from domestic violence and the three children. When we arrived, um, we, the, the Mesa PD officers, they transport the children to an undisclosed location and the victim. Um, this victim needed to be removed along with the children because the gentleman was... Um, addicted to drugs, and he had already been arrested. But now the family of this gentleman was coming to, uh, to cause harm to, 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 to the wife and, and even to the children. So we needed to take them to a, another location. Uh, uh, the nine-year-old child was the oldest of the three children. Um, one of the male officers called one of the female officers to come because it, there was some suspicion that the little girl had been molested. Um, so what happened is that they needed to take the child to the hospital, and that took about four hours. And we stayed with them, with the family, and with the police officers. We eventually took them to the, uh, to the, to the hotel so that they can be settled in. They weren't able to take out any clothes, no food, no toiletries, nothing. So middle of the night, two, three in the morning. We're at Walmart buying toiletries and whatever we can for this family. And we were able to do that because of your stewardship, because of your love that you have for God, because of your faithfulness for your church, the way that you are taking into account that part of our stewardship calls us to also become that community of faith that also goes out of our campus um, uh, area, that also engages people outside of this building, that we are not just an inward people, but that we are outwardly oriented. And we are glad to do that because we know that people are being ministered to. They may not become members of this church, but rest assured, this congregation, Vel de Rose United Methodist Church, was able to provide for a brief weekend a presence of peace. They, were, they felt loved. They felt encouraged that they were able to be taken care of. And Mesa PD knows about Vel de Rose Church. They can call us in the middle of the night. They can call us in early morning or at noon. And they know that most of the time, when the funds are available, Velda Rose Church will be present. This is what you get to do for our community surrounding our church. And we are grateful to you for doing that. And now, for our hymn of dedication, join us. We're going to do two small hymns, number 328 and number 393, surely the presence of the Lord and spirit of the living God. Participate. Sing along with us. 
Abiding in Christ will cause us to love the Lord with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. And now please receive God's blessing. Loving God, whom we praise and glorify as disciples of Jesus Christ, prune away the dead debris of our hearts and failures, so we may become productive branches in the church, reaching out to feed, to provide for, a world starving for genuine love and yearning for community. Go in God's grace. Amen.